the late 1970s, when many of us were too busy wearing leisure suits and listening to disco to notice that we were on the brink of a revolution in information technology, or that our old way of doing things was about to come to a screeching halt. Presented with a better alternative, we did what we always do. We ran with it. And in this case, the it was the way we listened to music. Recognize this? It's the original Sony Walkman introduced in 1979. The first mainstream personal music player. And on the eve of its release, the Japanese media were in solid agreement. They thought it would flop. Sony itself expected to sell only about 5,000 a month. And then a funny thing happened. People kind of liked it. Within two years, Sony had sold a million and a half Walkmans worldwide, sparking similar products from other companies that sold millions more. But that was just the beginning. Every year or two, new and improved models hit the market. And as quality rose, prices fell. To earn enough to buy the original Walkman, you had to work two weeks at a typical minimum wage job. And that was for lo-fi sound on cassettes you had to flip over every half an hour. But today, for just four days of work at that same minimum wage job, you can earn enough to buy a top-of-the-line digital audio player, one that lets you take 10,000 of your favorite songs wherever you go. Not that you couldn't do that in 1979. It just wasn't convenient. What's really amazing about the rapid spread and improvement of personal audio players is that it isn't amazing at all. It's perfectly normal. Great new gadgets and services are appearing and going viral every day. A decade ago, no one had ever heard of Google. Now they do tens of thousands of internet searches per second. Facebook went from zero to half a billion members in just five years. And the same thing is true outside the high-tech world in everything from organic grocery stores to disposable diapers. Basically, invent something good, and it gets big. And these days, it gets big fast. But of all the products we make and the services we provide, there's one that stands out as an exception to that overall pattern. There's one activity in which excellence doesn't spawn countless imitators or spread on a massive scale. And that exception is schooling. For generations, there hasn't been a single innovation in teaching that has transformed classrooms and improved student achievement worldwide. The closest thing to it can be found here, inside this 19th century schoolhouse. Let's have a look. And here it is, the blackboard. For the first 2,000 years of education history, it was hard for teachers to communicate complex visual information to groups of students. Wax tablets, like the one shown in this Greek vase painting, had been around since the 5th century BC. And that's how children learned to write, etching letters into the wax with the pointy end of their stylus and rubbing them out with the wide end. Useful as it was, it didn't allow teachers to reach the entire class all at once. 20 centuries later, we'd made the great leap forward to these, slate tablets and chalk. Bit of an improvement, certainly they're easier to erase, but it wasn't until the late 1700s that a Scottish schoolmaster named James Pillins had a really clever idea. He took all of those tablets off of students' laps and he hung them together on the wall. 
Suddenly, every student could see exactly what Pillins was talking about at the same time. By 1801, the blackboard had already crossed the Atlantic to the West Point Military Academy, and within a few decades could be found in even the remotest rural schoolhouses in America, just like this one. So there's an example of a brilliant educational idea, simple and effective, that took the world by storm in barely a generation. We know it can happen, but that was 200 years ago and nothing quite like it has happened since. Why haven't our classrooms been transformed by that same pattern of improvement and innovation that we take for granted in every other aspect of our lives? It isn't that we haven't tried. We're spending four times as much per pupil on a K-12 education as we did in 1970. And schools have adopted all sorts of new technologies over the years, from projectors to personal computers to smart whiteboards. The trouble is that none of these new inventions has improved outcomes, measurable outcomes, on a global scale. Let's take a look at something. American test scores at the end of high school have been flat since we started keeping track of them all the way back in the early 1970s. And the same thing is true in most other countries as well. Basically, educational quality has been stuck in the era of disco and leisure suits for 40 years, while the rest of the world has passed it by. Classrooms and clothes look a little different now than they did then, but we've changed the trappings of education without really improving the substance. Our best schools haven't grown and taken over the less successful ones. The top teaching methods haven't been replicated around the world. And while our greatest athletes and pop stars regularly reach mass audiences, our best teachers seldom reach more than a few dozen kids at a time despite all of our technological advances. Why not? Why doesn't educational excellence routinely scale up, spawn imitators, the way it does in other fields? We'll travel to every corner of the globe in search of an answer to that question. Our journey starts right now.